All right, so I wanted to start by quickly reviewing the website really quick. So again, all of the um, assignments due, the first one is the discussion. Uh, during each week here, week one, two, three, all the way to seven, that's where you're going to find the discussion. So you come here, see some people have already started doing it. You click on discussion one, um, discussion one again, and just add a post here. So you come here, add a post, type, you know, whatever you want right here, and submit. Okay. So that's your discussion. Anything for your wiki project is over here under wiki project when you click on it. Uh, you can go to the link right here. So let me go ahead and approve these people here. Pending. Okay, so some people have already start to uh, sign in, get their username, password, and stuff. So go ahead and start doing that. So again, you click on oops, Wiki Project listed over here, and then you can see the link, Wiki link, click here. Or you can come up here where it says how to sign in, and you can click on that right there. Uh -huh. However you want to do it, it doesn't matter, actually. Um, if you're going to have a common sign in, then just let everybody in the group know what it is. Uh, the one good thing about having your own is that, uh, let's say you were um, working on the project and your partner or whoever was working on it at the same time, you could do that at your home and have your own accounts. Uh, and it, anybody can edit it. So you have access to the page and so does anybody in your group. So it doesn't matter if you have the same username and password or individual. So it just, yeah. OK. So there's the wiki project, the discussion, the sapling homework. If you go to week one, I always have a link. Uh, here's also a link to the wiki spaces right here. So here's a link to the wiki. Here's the sapling. And those, that's everything that's due for lecture, OK? So sapling right here, wiki right here, and your discussion, OK? And those will be posted under every week, OK, one through seven. So you don't have to come back to here. And for your lab, can you all see the lab yet? Huh? Some OK. Over here, if I go to, I think everybody's just in the lab, same lab section. And it has everything posted on here. I also posted some videos. So lab orientation. I don't know why he's doing this, but it really does work. OK, so there's a lab safety video at the top here. And this works on my computer. I don't know why it always it never works on this computer. But uh, there's an orientation video that really does show up there. Let me know if it doesn't show up on yours. Um, it goes through the whole entire website. So you go through it, and it does it in like six minutes. Um, I also put on here, it says Echo Pre-Lab Lectures. If you click on there, it should have a list of all of them. No, it's still not. OK, I promise. <laughs> I don't know why he keeps doing this on this computer. But it does work. It has a list of all of them there. Um, and then under week one, because we're under week one right now, again, it has everything you need to do for each lab. And then it has like a little pre-lab lecture um, to listen to. They're usually like three minutes long to kind of go over the lab. Um, and then here's where you upload everything. This is just like a discussion board. And you upload everything onto here under forums. And you just, lab one goes under lab one, lab two goes under lab two, everything. So, so that's everything. Just start you know, clicking on buttons and seeing what they do. That's really the only way you'll fully learn. Uh, but I do have like the lab orientation video. So if you want just a little five, six minute video on where everything in the lab is located, um, 
and then back to the lecture. If you get stuck on anything here, just let me know. Usually, if you just look at the week that we're at, it'll have everything you usually need to know for that week. Okay. I sent out uh, an email f of the partners and everything. Let me know um, if you didn't get that so I can resend that out. I know some of you might not have had an email uh, set up yet, but let me know um, with that. And, oh, and then for the lab, everybody does have to buy their individual lab packet. Um, it has nothing to do with money. The university literally is selling you these lab packets at the price they bought them at. So they're not even making a cent off of them. So I don't want you to think they're like making money off of it. Uh, they just need to make it fair for everybody because some people can share, some people can't. So they decided just everybody has to buy one. But remember, this, uh, the lab packet does cover both organic one and organic two. Okay, so it's a one-time thing. Uh, think of it like the cost of your book. Instead of buying a book, you're buying this. Anyway, so that is um, everything there. So let me know if you'll have any trouble with this at all. This is all due Monday at midnight. So if you have trouble this weekend, um, we can still discuss it further on Monday, um, and we can all you know discuss it tomorrow too. So any questions before we go on? Yeah, and so it's just like a, the discussion board that, I don't know if you've done your discussion yet or not, but um, yeah, you can add like a Word document to put your lab on there, um, or P you add any file you want. And then for the video, just add the link. You know where you type in your response, you can say here's my video link, and then just paste it onto there. Yeah. Um, if you ever find that you're having troubles with the My Parker website, it happens occasionally, just email me your stuff, okay? I'm not going to count you off because the server is down or something like that, okay? Uh, email me or something, or somehow let me know. All right, so what we learned yesterday, uh, we looked at the atom. Okay, uh, what is in the nucleus of the atom? Protons and neutrons. And then what's on the outside? The electrons. What's the charge of the proton? Positive, neutron, neutral, electron, negative. Uh, which of those the subatomic particles uh, tells you the identity of the atom? Protons. Um, and then which one's responsible for bonding? Electrons. So electrons are important, so we need to know where they're located. So we looked at basically the area that they could be located. So we saw the S orbital, and what does that look like? Sphere, and how many shapes are there? One shape, and it can hold how many electrons? Two. Then there's the P orbital, what does that look like? Figure eight. How many of them are there total? Three, so it can hold six. Okay, so those are the locations, the you know expected area you could probably find an electron. Okay, then we looked at um, let's see. If I gave you this one, I gave you phosphorus thirty-two fifteen. Okay, and I want to know how many protons electrons and neutrons, what would you tell me? So how many protons? 15. Electrons? 15 also to neutralize the protons. If there was a charge on there, it would be located over here. Since it doesn't show one, then it's just zero. And then how many uh, neutrons? 17. So remember, to get the neutrons, you just subtract these two numbers from each other. Okay, then we also looked, or started to look at electron configurations, and remember this tells you the location of every electron in an atom. Okay, so let's practice with uh, 
Let's do oxygen. Pull up the periodic table. That's a little too close. <laughs> no, it's getting closer. And there it goes. Okay, so oxygen is right here. So remember, what you have to do is you have to follow the order of the periodic table, okay? And you look at each group. So this is the S block, these two columns here, the P block and then the D, and we'll go over D in a minute, but let's just look at S and P right now. So we have to look at the first row of S, okay, which is right here, and is oxygen located there? No, so we write down, we're looking at oxygen, one, S, two, because we looked at both of them. Now we go to the next one, which we here at three and four, and I stop right there because that's the end of the S block, okay? Is oxygen located there? No, so what do I write down? 2S2. Okay, now I come over here. Now what block am I in? P, is oxygen in here? Yes, where is it? One, two, three, four. So what do I write down for that? 2P4. Okay, and again, that tells you where every single electron is located. Uh, the electrons that actually bond are called the valence electrons. Those are on the outer shell. Think of it this way. So in the middle, uh, in the nucleus, we have protons. We also have neutrons, but it's the protons that are really important right now. Okay? On the outside here, I have some electrons, some electrons, Maybe some more electrons, okay? So this is like level one, two, three, okay? Now, positive and negatives are um, attracted to each other, like magnets, okay? So I think that this positive is like a really strong magnet. Which level, one, two, or three, is going to feel that magnet the most? One, because it's the closest. Because, you know, the closer you get the magnet uh, together, the more you're going to feel it, right? Okay, this is further away, right? A lot further away. Okay, does it make sense that these electrons are easy, um, easier to bond, easier to pull away than these? And so these are the ones that bond. These are the outer electrons, or also called valence electrons. Okay, since they're further away from the nucleus, they're the electrons that are the furthest away, they're easier to manipulate, and so they bond, okay? So if we're looking at oxygen here, what is our outer uh, layer? What's the highest, like these numbers here? Two, right? So we're looking at, so this is la um, layer one, if you want, and then here are two. Now, you have to count not just um, the P's, but all of the electrons in level two. So how many total do we have? Six. We have two, which are S and then four, which are P. So this tells you that oxygen has six valence electrons. So in its outer level, which happens to be level two here, there are six electrons located. Uh, let's look at fluorine really quick. And let's do the electron configuration and see if we can figure out the valence electrons. So here's fluorine. Okay, so what will I write down? What's the beginning? 1s2, then 2s2, 2p5. So fluorine would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p5.
Now, how many valence electrons here? Seven total. So you look at your outer level. So these give you your level and just count the total electrons. Okay? There is a shortcut. You can look at the group. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in just a little bit. I can see it better. Okay. Do you see like the Roman numerals here? Um, fluorine, you kind of see it maybe, is in group 7A. And how many valence electrons did it have? Seven. Oxygen is in 6A, and it had six valence electrons. So you can look at the group number, and it'll tell you how many valence electrons. So any of them in that column. So all of these in this column have seven, six, five, four, three. And you can come over here, one and two. Okay, so you could just look at the column. Look at the number above it, and it tells you how many valence electrons. And over here is eight. Now let's look a little bit at the D electrons. These are this is where you start getting into your metals, but uh, just practicing for electron configuration sake. D electrons oops, actually fill um, your D electrons start at level three. If you look here, this says four, okay. But they actually start at three. Let's see if I can find this picture. Mm. Doesn't really show up. Okay, but how they fill the D electrons are always uh, they start at n minus one if you want. So if I show you, uh, let's do bromine. Okay, bromine's a good one to see. So we start all the way over here. Bromine. And bromine, starting here, is what? 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then this is where it's um, a little bit strange. So right here, your Ds start at 3. Okay, so that's 3d10, and now Ps are still the same, that would be 4. So 4p5. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. 4s2, 3d10, 4p5, 5. So the only one that's a little bit strange there is your d, okay? And it's always um, one less than what you think it is. That's just how they fill. The D electrons, uh, you would think they would be right here, um, but the 4S electrons, energy-wise, are actually a lower energy than the 3D. Okay, so then how many valence electrons here? What's our outer level? Four. So if we count all the four electrons we have here and here, so a total of seven. Okay. Now, of course, there's a shortcut to do this. So you see, just even doing bromine, and bromine's just right here on the periodic table, it gets really long, okay? So here's what's called the noble gas configuration. Your noble gases are over here in column eight, okay? Um, these have full valence electrons, meaning they have the maximum amount of electrons. They're fully stable, um, pretty much not reactive. Okay, so what you do, for example, let's look at chlorine. The noble gas you're going to choose is the one above it. So the one you choose here would be neon. And you say that it has a full um, electron shell from neon, and then you do the rest of it. So if we're looking at chlorine, we say chlorine, you would choose neon. You're just saying, okay, my, the electron configuration looks just like neon, okay? And in addition, because we're not actually to chlorine yet, are we? No, so then you just start right here, 
and you say 3s2, and then over here, 3p5. So it's a lot shorter. And then we, let's look at bromine, because the bromine was the really long one we did. So if we go back, let's remember how long it is. Here, I write really big, so it took up a whole line for me. Bromine, what noble gas would you use? So here's bromine, argon. Oh, yeah. No, that's in. Okay, so uh, we use argon. So starting here, if we go right here, this would be 4s2, and then here, 3d10, and then over here, 4p5. So it's a lot shorter. You only have to do, you know, maybe one line on the periodic table. Again, this is a quick way using the periodic table as sort of a, a guide to show you where every single electron is located for that atom. All right, another representation of the electrons um, is called an electron diagram. And so let's look at, let me rewrite chlorine over here. Let me use the noble gas configuration. And what you do here is you represent um, electrons with arrows, okay? So S, for example, how many S shapes are there? One shape. So we put one line above it to represent the one shape, okay? And then what about P? How many shapes do we have there? Three. So three lines above that to represent um, the shape. Now let's come back over here. Now we need to put our arrows in. So 3s, how many electrons are there? Two. And how you do it, you spin one up, and then you spin one down. They'll always spin in opposite directions. Okay, now let's look here. Now the other rule is electrons don't like to be paired um, if they don't have to be, okay, because they're negatively charged. Uh, so they kind of repel each other a little bit. So how many do we have here? Five. So the first thing you want to do is maximize unpaired. So you're going to go one, two, three, and then fill in the rest, four, five. Now this can sometimes represent um, how many reactive electrons basically you have. If they're paired up, they're not reactive, but if they're unpaired, they are, okay? So we have basically one here that's reactive that wants to be paired up. Okay, so then uh, let's look at bromine then. Let's do the electron diagram for that. So we have argon, 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. Okay, how many lines for the s? One. D has five. One, two, three, four, five. And then P has how many? Three. So I have on here S is one, P is three, D is five. Okay, how many S electrons? Two. One pointing up, one pointing down. What about the D? 10, 
They're all going to be paired up. And then what about the P? Five again. One, two, three, four, five. So they kind of represent the same thing. It's just a different way of representing them. Okay? So this just tell this right here tells you sort of the coordinates of it. You know, this is located, these electrons here are located in level four, and they're found somewhere in a spherical shape. Okay? And this actually shows you that those electrons are paired up and stabilized. Okay? And so it's just, they just kind of work together, representing same but slightly different things. OK, now let's look at different types of bonds. So now that we kind of see where the electrons are located, they're located in these orbitals. And then we can get the coordinates of the proximal location of each of them. And uh, now let's actually look at bonding them. So there's different types of bonds. There's ionic, covalent, and metallic. Uh, this class mainly focuses on covalent bonding. Okay, Metallic bonding, the, I'm just going to give you the definition of that, and that's about it. It's a metal bonded with a metal. There's no um, metallic bonding in organic chemistry. You can have like an organometallic, but not a traditional metallic. Ionic bonding, we'll go over that in just a second, a little bit more. But it's always a metal with a non-metal. If I show you the periodic table, let me actually show you on the internet so you can see the colors. OK, so looking in here, do you see all of the blue area, even the light blue? OK, from here all the, way over, all the way over here, those are all metals. OK, so when they say metal, that's the majority of the periodic table. OK, your non-metals are going to be um, this kind of greenish area over here. OK, so a metallic bond is a metal with a metal. Okay, so a nickel bonded to a nickel. A um, ionic bond is whenever you have a metal bonded to a non-metal. Okay, so that's the easiest way to identify those is a metal with a non-metal. So like sodium chloride, that's sodium, you see over here in the blue, with chlorine over here in the green. Okay. And then there's the covalent, which is going to be a nonmetal with a nonmetal. So a carbon bonded to a nitrogen, or a carbon bonded to a hydrogen. Okay? So two things on the right side of the periodic table are bonded together. Uh, that is covalent. Um, something from the left bonded to something on the right, that's ionic. So if we look a, a little bit further into ionic, why do these occur? OK, so sodium metal is very explosive, OK? So would you want to just eat some sodium metal? No, probably not. Would you, would you just want to drink a bottle of straight out chlorine? Probably not either, OK? But do we eat sodium chloride all the time? Yes, as table salt, OK? Uh, this is, you know, obviously in moderation, relatively safe to eat, OK? We use it to season our food all the time. Um, so why are they individually very harmful, but together, not really? And so you have to look at uh, the stability of this. So you have sodium. On the periodic table here is right here. 
It's in group one. So how many valence electrons does it have? One. So if I just show that represented with a dot, meaning one valence electron. All right, and then chlorine is in group seven here, so it has seven. So how you do them, usually you pair them first and then unpair them. So one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven. Now, the key here is that everything wants to be like a noble gas, okay? Uh, these are extremely stable, um, and everything in chemistry works towards greater stability, okay? So the most stable elements on this whole entire periodic table are group eight, okay? So chlorine basically wants to become argon. So how many more electrons does it need? One more. Okay, let's look at sodium. Now sodium right here is uh, number 11. So it can either become a noble gas by becoming argon over here, but how many does it need to gain? A lot. Seven or something. Seven. Now, what if it lost an electron and became neon? How many would it need to lose? There's one. So this is element 11. This would be 10. So it just needs to lose one. So which one do you think is easier to do? Lose one. And then for chlorine, gain one. Okay? So if you look here, they kind of work together. Chlorine wants to gain one, and sodium here wants to lose one. Now, how many does sodium have? Conveniently, one. So basically, this electron moves right there. So then sodium, so right here, the charge on sodium is zero. That's neutral. But whenever you lose one electron, it'll become a plus one, because you're losing a negative charge, so you become positive. And then chlorine gained a negative charge, so its charge is now minus one. And then you can put the electrons around chlorine if you want. But you can see there, now both the sodium and the chlorine uh, have the reactivity of the noble gases. Sodium lost its electron, so it could become uh, like neon. And chlorine gained an electron, so it can become like argon. Uh, so now that they're very similar to noble gases, uh, this is stable. Okay, so that is how ionic bonds work. They work together by um, giving up electrons. Okay, so at the end, does sodium have any valence electrons around it? No, it gave them all up, and then chlorine gained one. So then if we look at covalent bonds, oh, and electronegativities. So electronegativity, um, basically what that means is the attraction to electrons. If you want electrons to be around you, then you're very, um, it's called electronegative. Okay? The most, electroneg most electronegative atom on the whole entire periodic table is fluorine, okay? So basically, the closer you are to fluorine, the more electronegative you are. So let's look at why fluorine. Uh, fluorine, for one thing, how many electrons does it need to become like neon? Mm -hmm. Just one more. So it's really easy just to grab that one electron, okay? Um, so it wants more electrons around it, okay? Also, uh, if we look at, you see this is in level two, okay? These electrons are very close to the nucleus then, okay? Do you see versus iodine? Its electrons go all the way out to level five, okay? So these are closer in, so basically that magnet, that nucleus, the strong magnet is attracting more electrons to it, okay? So because there's less levels or layers, I'm going to look at it here, versus down here, this is a stronger magnet, so it attracts more electrons, okay? So that's why fluorine is the most electronegative atom. And then if you look over here, uh, like sodium, for example, does sodium look like it's very electronegative? No, it's really far from fluorine, isn't it? 
yeah. So these over here, we actually call them electropositive. What's, uh, what charge did sodium have at the end after we, a plus one, okay? And then over here, we had chlorine had a negative one. So that's where electronegativity comes in. These will tend to have your negative charges. And these over here will tend to have your positive charges. So if you look at these, group one right here tends to have a plus one charge. If it is charged, it could be neutral. Um, group two tends to have a plus two charge. And if you're looking over here, fluorine and all of um, your halogens tend to have a negative one. Oxygen tends to have a negative two. So let's look at negative two. Do you see how far away is it from neon? Two, so how many electrons would it gain? Two, giving it a negative two charge. And then nitrogen here needs how many? Three, which would give it a negative three charge. Okay? And then boron here is actually closer to go the other way, plus three. Carbon in this group here is kind of a plus minus four, depending on what you're looking at. But the big ones here, one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. And those, if they're going to have a charge on them, um, that tends to be the charge they're going to have because that would make them like a noble gas. All right, so then the covalent bonds, this is between a metal, or I mean a nonmetal and a nonmetal. So if we're looking at, let's look at like CH4. Now the definition of a covalent bond is that it shares electrons, okay? Uh, if we go back to here, do you see that these electrons weren't actually shared, okay? Which atom took the electron? Chlorine. Did it share anything with sodium? Was sodium left with anything? No, okay? There's absolutely no sharing here in the final product, okay? But if we look at like CH4, and we'll go over how to do this here in a second, but let me just draw it right now. Okay, so here is what CH4 would look like. Now, do you see the lines here? Those are bonds, and anywhere they're connected, so do you see carbon is connected to this hydrogen? Those electrons are counted for carbon and for hydrogen. They actually share both of those electrons between each other. All right, now let's go back to the noble gas. This is in group eight. Okay, these are the most stable, remember? So how many valence electrons would they have? Eight, okay? Now, let's look over here. Let's look at this carbon. How many total electrons around it? It's shared, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, now, hydrogen's a little different. If I just look at one hydrogen, how many electrons does it have? Two. So the reason it wants two instead of eight, do you see hydrogen? What's the noble gas that it wants to become? Helium. So this is atom one, this is atom two. So it just needs to have a total of two to become like a noble gas. All right, so that's why hydrogen only wants two, but carbon wants eight, okay? But do you see that these electrons, when I counted the number of carbon electrons, I counted all of the dots, because it's connected to every line. But when I looked at a hydrogen individually, I only counted the ones that it was connected to, and I count both of them. So these electrons count for carbon and also for hydrogen. So do you see that they're shared there? And that's the difference. A covalent bond, everything shares their electrons, uh, versus an ionic bond, there's no sharing involved. One atom will take the electrons and the other one's left with nothing. And mainly what we're going to be dealing with is the covalent bond uh, like the CH4. Almost all of organic chemistry is covalent. So let's go over, let's do, we did CH4, let's do 
or let's, let's actually do CH4. Let's do a couple of these, and then we'll take a break. So we're going to look at uh, Lewis dot structures, because this is how we represent covalent bonds. And some of you might already know how to do them, but I still want to make sure. OK, so if we look at CH4, and we want to see how did I know to draw it you know, like this. Okay. First of all, when you're doing these, um, this tells you how many of each atom you have. You have one carbon, four hydrogens. Okay. Don't add any more atoms on there. Don't put a nitrogen all of a sudden on there. Okay. I promise you, if I write CH4, it just use four hydrogens, one carbon. Okay. So now you need to figure out what will your central atom be. Your central atom is always the least electronegative, with the exception of hydrogen. So hydrogen will never be your central atom. So in that case, that makes it easy. So if it's not hydrogen, then my central atom is carbon. OK? So write carbon down. Now, what I tend to do is draw the rest of the atoms as single bonds around that central atom. So do you see I have four hydrogens? So I'm going to draw those as a single bond. So draw a bond to one, two, three, four hydrogens there. Does anybody know how many electrons per bond? Two electrons. So think of like one electron at each end. Like that. OK, now you want to make sure you use all of, like the maximum number of electrons or your dots. OK, so you count your valence electrons. So carbon. Carbon is in group four, so how many valence? Four. What about hydrogen? One valence electron, but then how many do we have? Four. So when we add these together, four plus four gives me eight. So I should have used eight dots or electrons. So how many did I use? Eight. So this is fine. Don't touch it from here. OK? And then you can see everything once we call it like the noble gas configuration. Hydrogen has its two electrons. Carbon has the eight around it. OK? Um, hydrogen, as soon as you draw a single bond to it, don't touch it at all, OK? It will never have a double bond. It will never have a triple bond. It will never have what's called a lone pair. Hydrogen is only a single bond, and that's it, OK? Always. So let's look at um, NH3. What would be my central atom here? Nitrogen. And then what am I going to surround it with? Three hydrogens. Now, the location is not important. So if you put a hydrogen up here, it, it doesn't matter, as long as they're all bonded to that nitrogen. Okay, You can even put the hydrogen diagonal. It doesn't matter. OK, so we count our dots. We've used one, two, three, four, five, six. OK, but let's count how many we need to use. Nitrogen, do you know how many valence it has? Five. And then hydrogen has one. And then how many do we have? Three. So how many total? Eight. OK. We've used six. So how many more does it need? Two more. So what happens is um, they tend to like to pair up. Um, you always put them on the most electronegative atom first. OK. Between hydrogen and nitrogen, which one's closer to fluorine? Nitrogen. So nitrogen will get those two electrons there. 
and that is called a lone pair. Lone pairs uh, will come in, they're very important with uh, reactivity. They tend to be what reacts, okay? So you see this nitrogen has a lone pair, and it can make a bond to something else, okay? Um, how many electrons do you need for a bond? Two. So what it does, it basically uses those two electrons to bond to something else. So lone pairs usually signify that it can react with something else. All right, let's take a break. Let's say let's meet back here at 3. And we'll learn more.
right, let's start back up again. All right, so is there only one person interested in the online course? <laughs> Nobody at all? Okay. All right, so let's do some more practice problems. All right, so let's look at water. All right, what would be the central atom here? Oxygen. And what would it be connected to? Two hydrogens. So we've used one, two, three, four. Oxygen has how many valence? Six. And then hydrogen, one times two, so a total of eight. So then we've used four, so how many more do we need? Four, so what will that look like? Two lone pairs on oxygen. Okay, so let's do one that would be more of like what you would see for organic chemistry. I don't know why this I wrote down an example, I think. Here we go. So, okay, so something like this. Now, when you have them in a chain like this, you see they're listed kind of like in a line. That tells you how they're connected. Okay, so you don't have to really worry about the central atom. I mean, it's carbon. But how many total carbons do I have? Three. So one, two, three. They're all connected to each other. Do you see they're listed that way in a line? This first carbon here has how many hydrogens? Three. The second one has two. And this last one has three. Now you can go back and you can count the valence electrons. Uh, but a short way to look at this, carbon always wants four bonds. Okay, Four bonds would be eight electrons. So let's look at this carbon here. How many lines coming off of it? Four. So that one's stable. That one's good. Uh, this carbon? Four. See, one, two, three, four. And then that carbon? Four. And then how many bonds does hydrogen always like to have and only like to have? The one. So all of your hydrogens are fine. Nothing violates a rule. So uh, you actually don't need to, have to check your electrons there. Okay, so let's look at when they have double and triple bonds. How do you know when they have that? So let's look at um, CH2 oxygen. Okay, so this is sort of the order they'll go in. So these hydrogens, you see, are going to be coming off that carbon. And then oxygen doesn't have any hydrogens. So out of those, which one would be your central atom? Carbon. OK, now you connect everything else with a single bond. So let's say like hydrogen, 
hydrogen, oxygen. Okay, do our hydrogens look good? Yeah, they have that single bond that they want. Uh, let's look at oxygen. So usually what you look at is called the octet rule. You want you know eight electrons total around it. So do you see that oxygen is sharing this bond with carbon? But how many total does it have right now? Two. It needs a lot more, right? How many more does it want? Six. So you're going to pair those around oxygen. Like that. Okay. So oxygen has a total now of eight. Uh, what about carbon? Does it have the four bonds that it likes? No. How many more bonds does it want? One more. Okay. Uh, what you do here is you choose one of your lone pairs and you move it over as a bond. Remember how many electrons per bond? Two. So that's why you need the whole entire pair there. So if you redraw this, We now will have two bonds between carbon and oxygen. And how many lone pairs now on oxygen? Two. So now hydrogens look good with their one bond. Carbon, do you see, has its four bonds around it. Now oxygen, how many total electrons? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's basically, if it violates a rule, so basically if you don't have your eight electrons around it, then you're going to do a multiple bond. So if we look at, um, here, let's do, like this. All right, so we're going to have carbon bonded to carbon. You see there, they're connected. And then what's coming off each of those carbons? A hydrogen. OK, are the hydrogens fine? Yes. What about the carbon? No, let's just look at one at a time. So how many bonds does that one have coming off of it? Two, and this other one? Two. So both of them need how many more? Two additional bonds, which will end up being your triple bond. All right, so let's make a long one. Let's mix up some stuff here. Might as well just throw everything in there, right? OK, do you see that it's all in a chain, right? OK, so we're going to connect. Hydrogens don't matter. They're always branching off, OK? But you connect everything else in a chain. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 carbons there. So let's go ahead and draw those. 1, 2, 3, 4. Five, six, seven, eight. And what's coming off the end here? Nitrogen. So you always start with single bonds, and then we'll work from there. Okay, now all you need to do is draw in your hydrogens. Okay, so let's do that first. This carbon has how many? Three. This carbon has two. Uh, this carbon, zero, zero, two. 
here. One, one, and zero. Okay, so now we have everything on there. So now you want to check for your multiple bonds. Are there going to be some double, triple, are they going to say single bonds? So let's check that. Um, our hydrogens, they always want a single bond, so they're all good. So let's check our carbons. How many does it want to have? Four. Is this one okay? Yes. This one? This one? No. Is this one? No. How many does this one have? Two, and this one also has? So between those two, how many more do you want? Two more. So you're going to put your triple bond there. So you see now both of these have four. Uh, what about this carbon? Four? Three? It's not good. This one? Three again. So what do I need between those? Double bond. It'll always work out that way that the one next to it would need the exact same thing. Okay. Okay, so this one's good now. What about this one? Triple bond, right? And where will it triple bond to? Nitrogen. And then let's go ahead and check nitrogen. This is where your lone pairs will come in. And um, there's nothing else to bond to it, right? Um, can you make any more bonds to carbon? No, four is the max, OK? Uh, how many total electrons is it sharing? So one, two, three, four, five, six. But how many does it want? Eight. All, they always want eight. So I need one lone pair. Carbon almost never has a lone pair. So you usually don't have to worry about carbon checking that out. It's usually, uh, for organic chemistry, you're looking at like nitrogen, oxygen, or a halogen. Your halogens are going to be like fluorine, bromine, chlorine, iodine, group 7. OK, so that's a quick way to do it. Again, you see when you get these large molecules like this, it, it would take a long time, not really that long, but it would kind of be a waste of time to count every single valence electron and count all the dots and make sure they add up and everything. So what you can do, again, is just remember carbon always wants four bonds around it. Hydrogen only wants one bond. And then from there, just kind of figure it out. Okay if it's going to have a double or triple or single bond. So does it make sense when you look for a double bond versus a triple versus a single? Again, the magic number is four for carbon. And since this is organic chemistry, we're pretty much dealing with carbon. So that's what makes it easier. So if I have something on the exam, you know, if I make you do a Lewis dot structure, it's going to be closer to this, because that's really what you see in organic chemistry, is these long chains like this. Okay, don't worry about bonding patterns. You can look at that if you want, but it's just more memorization. It doesn't really matter. Okay, charged species. Let's do this bottom one here because this one's going to be closer to other things that we'll use. So, The big thing, if you are counting your electrons, okay, so we have carbon, which would be four, hydrogen, one, oxygen, six, times three, 18. So then 
we have a negative 1. So what do you think we do there? We're counting electrons. So if you have a negative charge, you're going to add 1 because you have an additional electron. So then you would add on here a plus 1. And then you can add them up that way. So that's the big thing with charges. Anytime you have a negative charge, you're going to add that number to your total. Anytime you have a positive charge, you're going to subtract that number. OK, uh, but looking on here, which one would be our central atom? Carbon. OK, and then connect everything else. Hydrogen, oxygen. Um, oh, wait, do they have it? No. This should actually be like this. H over here. CO3H. So let me redraw this. So that ox, or not ox, the hydrogen is actually connected to what? Oxygen. So you have your three oxygens coming off carbon. And then one of your oxygens, it doesn't matter which one you choose, will have a hydrogen. I'm just going to put it right here. Okay, so let's look at this. This oxygen here, how many total electrons does it have around it? Four. One, two, three, four. So how many more does it want? Four more. Two, three, four. Uh, what about these oxygens? It has two total, so it needs six more. And then the same for this one here, also needs six. Now, if you counted there, that's actually all the electrons you have to use. Okay? Uh, but our central atom, carbon, is it happy like that? No, because it only has three bonds, so it wants one more. Where do you think it will get it from? Double on the one of the oxygen. So grab one of the lone pairs, move it over. You could have used that one too, either one. So now instead of three lone pairs, I will have four. And the structure would look like that. Now one thing you can do, and you need to know how to do, is calculate what's called a formal charge. Okay? And that is looking at the structure right here. Um, it's kind of like an accounting kind of thing. Are you using uh, the maximum amount of valence electrons? Are you using more than you're supposed to, less than you're supposed to? Uh, and that's pretty much what it is. So let's look at hydrogen, for example, for calculating the formal charge. Um, hydrogen on the periodic table is in group one. So it should have one valence electron. So how you count these, each bond is counted as one, and lone pairs are counted individually. Okay? So if we're looking at hydrogen, does it have any lone pairs? No, but it has one bond. Okay? So it should have one valence electron, and it's using one bond. So you see how they match up? So its um, formal charge is zero. So let's look at uh, this oxygen right here. Oxygen has how many valence electrons? Six. So we write down six. That's the number. If it's going to be zero, I have to count six. Um, how many bonds do I have? One bond. And if I count all of my dots together, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So six plus that one would be... Seven, right? Six plus one. So then you do six minus seven. I'm using an additional electron, right? So if I have one extra electron than what I, I should have, the charge will be a negative one. It's always subtracted here. So you look at how many valence electrons it should be using and subtract how many it's actually using. So let's look at this um, oxygen there. 
This one also should have six, right? And then we count, we have one, two, three, four, five, six that it's actually using. So it would be zero. Carbon has how many valence electrons? Four, and it's using four. The reason you count the bonds is only one, because you're looking at contributing electrons. So if I draw, let's say, let's look at this oxygen right here. Do you see oxygen and carbon are sharing those two, right? But that electron is actually coming from carbon, and this electron is actually coming from oxygen. So if you look at not the shared electrons, but only the electrons coming from oxygen, for example, that would be your seven right there. Okay? And then over here, if I put in the dots, okay, you see oxygen has these one, two, three, four, those four, but you see out of these four, how many are actually from oxygen? Just those two. So if I cover that up, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so that's why instead of counting a bond as two, you're looking at how many is that atom actually contributing to that bond, and it's always one per bond. Okay, so again, this is sort of counting kind of thing to see are you using uh, you know the same amount of valence electrons you should be, or are you using more or less? If we look up here, what was the overall charge of this structure? Negative one. And so if you look down here, which atom is contributing to that negative one charge? That oxygen right there. Okay? So it tells you where is that negative charge coming from. It tells you specifically which atom. So if we look at another one, uh, they have H3O plus on here. Okay, what would be the central atom? Oxygen. And then it's connected to hydrogens. Okay, are the hydrogens fine? Yeah? What about oxygen? No, how many more electrons does it need? Two more. So now it gives it a total of eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But when we're actually doing a formal charge, not counting all the electrons, when I say all the electrons, that's shared and everything. But formal charges is only, you can call it the contributing electrons. So how many electrons uh, is, does oxygen actually contribute? I've heard like 10 different numbers. So one, two, three, four, and how many should it contribute? Six. So six minus five is a plus one. And you see overall that charge is a plus one. So our total electrons is all the electrons shared and paired. Formal charge is only contributing electrons. And I would write that down and star it. I know that's a very common thing to miss on the exam. If I have you calculate formal charge, you accidentally calculate total electrons or something. Because then there's another thing we're going to do in chapter two that we're going to be counting electrons, but it's for something else. So obviously, you're going to count them differently. So the three things. Well, the two things we know so far, how to count electrons, would be your total electrons and then the formal charges, which would be contributing. So make sure you know to, how to distinguish between those two. All right, so I'm going to take this last 30 minutes, approximately, and give you that national exam. OK, I know. I'm excited, too. <laughs> um, I'll have these posted tomorrow.
All right. Um, let me start handing these out. Don't start them yet. I know you're like anticipating. You're just wanting to get this <laughs> over with. One, two, three. So how this is going to work, um, if you see on there, uh, number 71 is actually number one on your Scantron. Does that make sense? So please do not start on number 71 on your Scantron because then I will have to bubble it back for you. So number one on your Scantron will be number one or number 71 on the paper. Does that make sense? So 71 starts number one. And then from that point on, uh, all the way to number 100, you'll finish that. So there's going to be 30 total at the end. Yes. You don't have Scantron? Uh, she has. Oh, you need another test? Here. Um, don't write on the exam because I'll use them again. Uh, if you want paper, um, I guess just come over here and grab it if you even need it. Um, this is organic chemistry, so we really don't use calculators. Um, you can have one out if it really makes you feel better, but I doubt there's any math on there. Um, you have 20 minutes total to do it. I'm going to time you. So you have 30 questions, 20 minutes to do it. So yes, that's less than a minute per question. When you're done with it, just turn it in up here. So put your Scantron on one pile and then the exam on the other. Um, and then when you're done, you're done for the day. In one second. All right. Um, before you start, uh, let me know if you change your mind. If you are interested in the online course, they have to have, I think, at least like three people to make it anyway. Uh, remember that uh, just because you're in the online course doesn't mean you can't actually come to class. You can come to class as much as you want, but it gives you a little flexibility. Um, with work or whatever. Or if you're traveling and there's like a day or two you can't be there, the online course makes it nice or it doesn't matter because attendance is not taken for you. Okay? Anyway, so think about that and begin. <laughs> 